Good Give morning, me. everybody. And thank you all so much for coming for this early opening. <laughs> we, um, we actually wrote this talk together, and it was all on paper, and we've just ripped up the paper, and we're going to speak to you from our hearts. At this moment, on this planet, what is going on environmentally and ecologically with life is indescribably sad. I'm sure you all feel and tap into that sadness. Nature's stories are ripe to be told and creation is thirsting to hear them. Through our actions, above the din and the white noise, the kerfuffle of humanity. To store, to restore, and to restory the tales that want to be told. We love nature, as I'm sure all of you do, but are you all completely sure that nature loves you? And it's through this Reciprocity that through this understanding that nature loves us, that we look after nature, the way that we look after our herb gardens and our food gardens. If we weed and take care, we're fed with abundance. And this talk, this presentation that we're doing today is about the fly agaric mushroom, the Amnita muscaria. But it's underpinned with the message of using these gifts from nature to help to reconnect with her beauty, with her abundance, and with ourselves. And in doing that, to really start to, to care for, to husband the earth, and to protect her from greed and violence. Breaking Conventions has been running for eight years, and in that time, the psychedelic renaissance has grown and grown and flourished. The media has shifted the spotlight on horror stories about psychedelic trips to more positive news about medicinal research. And nowadays, you can learn about psychedelics in a variety of arenas. There's a plethora of workshops and courses that you can do um, to learn about them, which is amazing. And there's a lot still that needs to be done. And on a personal level, we feel that there's always more that we can do to connect with herbs, to encourage more biodiversity within the hedgerows. We, as David said, are the Seed Sisters, and we have recently written a book. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, the Sensory Herbal Handbook, which is a celebration of nature. It's a walk through the seasons. We like to get really creative with our connection with plants, underpinning everything, our scientific learning and our scientific background with a much more heartfelt herbalism. And for the Fly Our Garret, which we'll be talking to you about today, we wanted to open with celebration of the element of spirit. I am spirit. Catch sight at the change of light, playful wisdom deep in sight, boundless freedom free flow where the only constant is change. Wondrous new journeys, ages old, the wisdom of generations holds movement through familiar lessons. Playfulness in death, birthing freedom through discipline, seeking inside to discover the divine. Blowing on the winds, deep down in the soil, flowing with the currents, burning in flames, pulsing through your veins, I am spirit. <laughs> the Fly Our Garret has been caught up in this psychedelic renaissance. We're seeing people reusing this wonderful fungus. And because it's got so much history and so many mythologies and stories caught up with it, we're also seeing quite a lot of room for error when people are trying to use it medicinally in particular. And a lot of confusion. I just met someone in the toilets preparing for the talk and she said, oh, look at you. I said, oh, I'm dressed as a fly agaric mushroom. And she said, of course you are. We harvested some of those in 1982 in Epping Forest and we took them back to our squat and we laid them out on the floor and we watched them rot because we didn't know what to do with them. 
And I thought, that was 1982, and there's still a lot of confusion around this mushroom, which has seen this massive explosion in use. And as herbalists and as travellers of the, the other worlds and the astral planes, we like to incorporate both of those things into the medicine that we use. We don't see psychotropic plants as something separate from herbal medicine. And it's something that's not often talked about or taught within the herbalist arena. But what we know about the fly agarot is that this mushroom has a direct response to our eyes. Not only the fact that it's bright red, the colour of passion and fire. Our ancestors saw reds in fire and blood, these primal energies. It attracts us. When it pops up in the forest, who doesn't feel joy? Yeah. Attracted to move towards it and see who this is. And that's part of its communication with us. It's saying, come and have a look. It's shouting at us, this mushroom. But we know that this mushroom also has physiological effects on our eyes. It actually can help with elongating cell structures in our eye and supporting short-sightedness. And the way we work, we look at the micro affecting the macro, how the physiology on humans can actually affect our connection with the rest of society. If our... So we layer up the, the messages from the plants. We look at how the plants and fungi interact with the body, with the, the spiritual, emotional and physical body. And then we use that as clues or an indication as to the message the, the plants might be giving us in a much wider, broader sense, not as individuals, but as a society and as a connected, unified planet. So we have this very physiological action of the fly agaric on the structures within the eyes that actually improve long-sightedness. They actually give us the wider picture the long view and the eyes are very much seen as the window to the soul and could it be an indication that the fly agaric is in some way suggesting that we could be more interconnected as people and to the planet there's an old system of medicine dating back to Dioscorides, Dioscorides and Galen that looks at how spirit has stamped a mark on all of life, on all of the plants and fungi. And that could give messages to the medics of how they can use it in the body. This is called the doctrine of signatures. And when we have, we always get people to draw. We always draw the plants or the fungi. And in all of our workshops, when people draw the fly or garret, gill side up, of course it looks like an iris and you'll see on the slides we've taken a spore print that looks beautifully like an iris. So that's very much an indication as to what the plant or the fungi might have been used for. We use it in an application in many different situations in clinical practice, one of which is supporting the walk towards death. Um, we've done a lot of work in this area with various different plants um, and it's often that we've become very separated from death in our society generally and uh, there's an amazing book that was written by Jennifer Worth that talks about the change in medicine from the 1950s towards preserving life at all cost. And it's started to go back the other way. There's death conferences at the minute um, that are going on and bringing this also a renaissance in acceptance of end of life and how we can celebrate and support it more. And because this mushroom is so familiar to people through fairy tale, we know it through the caterpillar smoking his hooker. There are mythologies that cite Santa Claus and Jesus are both mushrooms. These mythologies are contentiously debated, but whether they're true or not, they are out there in the consciousness. People and, have those connections. And they are great stories that are connected with this mushroom. We talked about the attraction earlier, and it sparks imagination. 
It's been found in artwork and stories throughout history, really inspiring uh, creativity and imagination. And when our patients are dying and we are counselling them to be able to accept their own death, being able to weave story into your own life, being able to face very intense things in a more creative way has helped people immensely. So we actually work to restory at the end of life to help bring forth any uh, anxieties or unfinished situations that people might want to explore. And we do it through creating pieces of writing, story recordings, working with family members as well. And this mushroom can really help to support that journey. We've seen it um, work incredibly against all kinds of fears and anxieties. And we know because of its pharmacology why that might be. So the gamma aminobutyric acid or the GABA um, neurotransmitter that's within our neurological system is actually an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it, it dampens down neural activity. So where there's excitated neurons it, during uh, a fearful or anxious situation, the fly agaric can actually promote the production of the gamma uh, and the GABA and therefore relaxing and calming overexcited nerves. So it's been used a lot with fear and anxiety, which obviously plays into the death picture as well, but fears and anxieties generally that people might have. And in fact, in 1977, gaboxidol was synthesised directly from the Amanita muscaria as an anti-anxiolytic. I mean, it's now being, since it's being used for sedation and for sleep, which is another prime application of the Amanita muscaria. They noticed that when they were using it as an anxiolytic, one of the effects, the, the side effects, which are all actually just effects, was also that people were experiencing this sedation. So they started bringing it in to use for sleep promotion. So what we did over the last 15 years is try to collect as much data from medicinal herbalists and psychonauts as we could. And three years ago, we created a survey and have sent that out to many, many people. And we've won we were very interested in adverse effects because as people working with patients, we wanted to understand what the potential dangers were. There's a fantastic herbalist in Finland Henrietta Kress, and she published a book three years ago, and the very last page of her book sets out an old Finnish recipe. So it's um, taking a pint of vodka, 40%, adding two fly agaric mushrooms that are smaller than four centimetres, chopping them up, putting them into the vodka, which creates a tincture, an alcoholic medicinal extract of the plant. So you've got a very... Uh, a relatively weak uh, tincture with just the two mushrooms in a pint left for two to three weeks strained out and then two to three drops of that used externally at the origin of the site of pain usually in sciatica so this was her recommendation now since then we have seen social media posts with all kinds of um, different dosages and re relating it as a cure for sciatica. Or no dosages written at all but showing jars almost packed full of amnita and then information about Siberian shamans or um, people utilising it for altered states but then not really indicating anything about dosage. And this information is getting out there. We all know what social media is like. And people are in pain with sciatica, so of course they're searching. So on a Google search, if you search what's good naturally for sciatica, you will find Amnita muscaria. Huge different disparating um, information. So 
what we've seen, what we've collected, is one of the potential side effects that we've seen is tachycardia, panic, and fear that you are dying. And that's from an external application. One of those external applications was completely in line with Henrietta's um, dosage advice, but he spilt it. He spilt a bit on his knuckles, and instead of washing his hands, he just took a dry kitchen towel. Now, that gentleman in his late 60s thought he was dying. He ended up going to hospital with severe tachycardia, a rapid heart rate, high blood pressure, fear of death, panic and anxiety. Now, you might think that this increased heart rate sounds contrary to what we were saying about it, uh, the GABA neurotransmitter relaxing neural activity, but there's also uh, receptor cells in the parasympathetic nervous system that keeps the heart rate regulated and down. So in encouraging this GABA within the parasympathetic nervous system, you're, um, because it's, it's blocking or relaxing that neural activity, which is a parasympathetic action, the heart rate can actually go up. So where you can see sedating actions, you can also see this stimulation of the heart as an overall effect. This was quite a rare um, adverse effect. There was one other reported, but it's always worth noting and understanding, especially if someone's going to has a history of high anxiety or any kind of heart issue. We had a phone call um, about this lady who'd been administered um, the fly agaric, and it was again externally full pain, but not according to Henrietta's um, advice. And it was applied to broken skin. And again, this was a tachycardic uh, reaction, um, but the anxiety was long lasting. She did visit the GP about it, and there was no uh, signs that there was any neural damage, which is quite hard to detect anyway. Um, but um, in that case, the anxiety has continued, and she's actually seeking treatment and therapy for that now. But this is from literally hundreds of people using it in both a clinical setting and in a more astral travel, uh, psychonaut type setting. And we've only had these two more worrying reports of adverse reactions. More commonly, people report loss of sensation, where they've put the external preparation, and sedation. One person in particular peeled um, the red cap, rubbed a little bit on the back of his neck, passed out and was sedated for two full days. <laughs> So that's been one of the most um, dramatic sedations we've seen. The most common report is on ingestion of the fresh mushroom, and that's usually for altering states of perception. Um, people take it and then experience nausea, vomiting, which I'm sure several people have had that experience before. And what we always say to people, if you wish to explore this particular mushroom, have milk thistle. Milk thistle, the fabulous purple regal thistle that is a superb liver detoxifier, supports your neurology, and is the antidote to amnita poisonings. So if you're going to do it, make sure you take your milk thistle with you. And also explore preparations. So during the drying of the amnita mushroom, actually some of the more irritant to the digestive system compounds get converted. We always dry in quite high heat in a, dry, a dehydrator with the fly agaric. So really do some research into preparations. All of these things we always utilise in very small doses and in combination with other herbs. We were taught by a fabulous herbal wizard from North London, Christopher Headley. He passed away sadly a couple of years ago, but he was our herb mentor and teacher. And Christopher told us that um, he had begun exploring the fly agaric in the late 60s and he got all of his information from pamphlets that were circulating at the time. He always mixed 
the fly agarit. So never used it as a simple, in herbal terms, that means as a plant on its own. And he mixed it with a plant called fireweed or rose bay willow herb, epilobium. epilobium. Um, we, when we first heard about uh, epilobium, we read in a really old herbal that it was only for ingestion by the angels. And it always made us shy away from it a little bit. There was something reverent about this herb. Um, but now we're wondering if it's something to do with this long history of its use in combination with the fly agaric. He actually got that information from pamphlets that were produced in the 60s. And it was stating that this has been a traditional mix in Northern Europe for centuries. And we know through herbal pharmacology that anything high in tannins helps to precipitate out alkaloids. So it's possible that the rose bay willow herb that's high in tannins in some way makes the absorption more slow acting and potentially less toxic. But the epilobium, this rose bay willow herb, fireweed, that is one of the first plants to come back after a fire, is fabulous for any kind of gut problems. It's also a wonderful um, nervine tonic and anti-toxicity agent for the brain. So we create a combination of woodland herbs. Yeah, like this time of year, we're up in the local woods and underneath that beautiful silver barked pendulous birch tree. The lady of the woods. Nestled between the heather and the bilberry grows this wonderful, wonderful mushroom. And as you look into the clearings, the rose bay willow herb is swaying with her pink heads. So these are all under the ground. These are all connected with the mycelial threads. They're all part of this family together. And that's the way we create mixes. We go out into nature and we look at what's growing together, what's naturally communicating together. And then what combinations or actions or support for the system we feel that we might need to work in combination with these power plants. So we create a mix from the silver birch, from the bilberry, from the heather, from the epilobium, the fireweed, and or the rose we, bay willow. What we know is that that bilberry, bilberry, blueberries, supports the tiny little microvasculature that gets to the ends of your fingers, your toes, your nose, your ears, and feeds your eyes. Bilberry has also been brewed with the rose bay willow herb and the amanita in Siberia for a long time. They make a, a wine from it. They brew from the pith of the rose bay willow, so it's really been a long combination with the bilberry um, in many different places. But what we've done, we've created these drops and in our clinical practice, we have applied them for a range of different ailments from blurred vision, Lyme's disease, chronic fatigue. We've talked about death and dying. Christopher taught us that the prime application is in suicidal depression. And he had fantastic anecdotes, one in particular about a lady who'd tried to take her own life twice, was completely and utterly cold and had no zest for life and the amanita in in a combination really helped to turn her around to the point that within three months she'd moved to a greek island from london and she creates her own flower remedies creates her own story <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we um we also use it as we mentioned for sleep and in this walk to to death and dying um one a client of ours, actually it was his wife that got in touch with us and um, she had heard that we'd worked with people with cancer before and her husband had a terminal diagnosis and she wanted some help. Neither of them were ready to let go. Within four weeks that man was no longer with us, but within that time, we worked with both of those people with this combination, as we mentioned, to help restory, to help bring them to a, a place of more acceptance. Epilepsy is another application, and in epilepsy, we've been using a slightly different mix. 
As medical herbalists, we are not allowed to treat epilepsy in this country, so there is no information circulated in our community. All the information that we gleaned came from the veterinary medicine community. People are seeking help, and we had to go to the vets to find out. The Amanita, in combination with valerian, skullcap, and other neural sedatives, has been incredible in our work with epilepsy. Recently, a Syrian refugee family in Berlin got in touch, and their daughter was having four fits a day. From just valerian tea bags, she's gone down to one every week. It's really important this information is proliferated because you can't find it anywhere. So we are calling for more um, information, more collation of data for people to understand what's happening when these adverse reactions occur, but not to, um, not to place too much onus on them because of all the other amazing stories. We need a balanced view because what happens is as these scare stories come out, people stop using these medicines. Um, and the reason these scare stories are happening is because there isn't the information and the knowledge out there. So we encourage everybody to be really uh, conscious and connected with everything that they take. Going out, sitting with it in, in its natural environment, hanging out with the fly agaric, drawing it, writing stories, creating costumes and characters around it. And this is our plant dream, our fungal dream of fly agaric. I am fly agaric the most stylishly attractive mushroom in the universe. <laughs> Whirling polka-dotted presents, timeless tales tapped through this toadstool's muscarinic mycelium. Wood, wide, web, whirling. White-veiled creature of the fall, the most attractive of them all. Pushing forth with silent shouts, look at me, your fungal flamenco friend. I have gifts of myth for you, gifts of myth mapping magical realms. I store, restore, restory tales that want to be told, deepening sleep invitation to dream, spores spreading soma in outer space, immortal vitality pain relieving powers, sciatica spasm. Visual views brightened, heightened, pixies, elves, fairy folk, inspiring connection, rewiring curiosity, mind manifesting mysteries. I grant wishes. I am Amnita Muscaria. Mm -hmm. Thank you.